Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Amelia Holmes, and I am excited to introduce you to our speaker. Nidra K. Lee is an assistant professor in the anthropology department at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin, and her research interests include the archaeology of the African diaspora, gender, critical race studies, and processes of racial formation during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She has conducted research on historic black sites in Texas that have included extensive collaboration with descendant communities and is excited to expand her research to the past lives and experiences of black people in New England. She has received funding from the Ford Foundation and the Texas Historical Commission. Her research has also been published in the Journal of Historical Archaeology, the Journal of African Diaspora Archaeology and Heritage, and Transforming Anthropology. Thanks again. I'll turn it over now to Nidra. Thank you, Amelia, for that really warm and pleasant introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking to the Nantucket Historical Association and the broader island community on Recovering Black History Through Archaeology on Nantucket Island. The study of the African-American past in New England has largely sought to increase the representation of African-Americans in mainstream accounts of the region's history. Scholars have worked to dispute the myth that slavery in the Northern United States was more benign than the South. Scholars have also aimed to document the history of free Black communities that developed following the gradual abolition of slavery. Although these communities emerge from the rigid color line that buttressed race-based race -based slavery and segregation, these communities were also defined by a strong ethos of Black self-help, entrepreneurship, and a commitment to Black freedom. Despite the increased visibility of African-American history in New England, significant gaps remain in our understanding of the social and economic organization of free Black communities. While archaeology has played an integral role in the preservation of African-American historical landmarks on the region's physical landscape, the recovery of artifacts representing the simple activities of daily life have raised questions about the role that Black women and other women of color have, helped, have played in helping maintain and support their communities. Nantucket provides an interesting case study to address the question of Black women's labor, both Black women's labor as it relates to supporting their households and their communities. Nantucket's ascendancy to the capital of a global whaling industry presented both men and women regardless of race and ethnicity, ethnicity with diverse opportunities for social and economic advancement. For African-American men, the participation in the whaling industry provided them with opportunities to not just earn money to buy their freedom, but to establish homes, to transition into more land-based economies. For women, and particularly white women, it also presented them with an opportunity to flout conventional 19th century gender norms and to contribute to the support of their families as well. The archeological study of the Boston Higginbotham House, a 19th century African-American welling household, however, has given us an opportunity to actually understand the lives and experiences of a group under examined within the island's historical context, and that's black and women of color. Archaeology has greatly contributed to the representation of African American history on the island. The Museum of African American History, which is New England's largest museum dedicated to the preserving, conserve, conserving, and interpret, interpretation of the contributions of African Americans of two historic sites and trails on Nantucket Island. Four, if you count actually the two sites and trails that they own in Boston as well. The museum is dedicated to telling the story of African American community life from the colonial period to the 19th century. For Nantucket, they have used archaeology 
in particular to understand the African American, African American community's participation in the whaling industry, as well as to document their fight to integrate the island's public schools. Beginning following their acquisition of the African Meeting House in 1989, the museum has actually conducted excavations at both the African Meeting House and the Boston Higginbotham House during the years of 1993 and 1996, 2008, and 2014. Excavations were primarily geared with the goal, geared towards achieving the goal of restoring these properties to their original appearance during the 19th century. However, the extensive history that was preserved in the archaeological record has also allowed for us to ask bigger questions about the evolution of the New Guinea community, which is the island's <clears throat> first or er the island's earliest free black community. Together, the African Meeting House and the Boston Higginbotham House are two of the remaining vestiges of the New Guinea community. So this slide is just a picture of the meeting house following its restoration. Um, the excavations, um, I'm gonna go back to a previous slide. As you can see here, the excavations of the property at the, uh, at the meeting house were done in 1993 and 1996. The slide only um, identifies the excavation units that were put in in 1996. And these excavations were led by Dr. Mary Beaudry at, from um, Boston University. However, subsequent excavations at the site, which have actually taken place specifically at the Boston Higginbotham House, which is actually located on 27 York Street, you'll see these in blue and green. The green excavations are the 2008 excavations, which were led by Dr. David Landon, um, who is the Associate Director of the Fisk Archaeological Research Center here at UMass Boston. And then those in blue are the excavations that were conducted in 2014. Um, I am actually presenting today because Dr. Landon invited me to join the project as a um, consultant, ultimately provide, um, helping them identify and better interrogate African American history through the archaeology, um, through the, through the archaeology that was done at the site in 2008 and 2014. The excavations that were done in 2008 and 2014, in conjunction with the excavations that were done in 90, 1993 and 1996, have uncovered a span of almost 200 years of African American history on the island. The excavations at the Boston Higginbotham House have especially documented the habitation of the property by multiple generations of the Boston family. The Bostons are one of the island's most well-known Black families. They were a free Black family that, was, that comprised of prosperous mariners, entrepreneurs, and community leaders during the early to mid 19th century. And we are most familiar with the Bostons through the life of Captain Absalom Boston, who was one of the first Black whaling captains um, on the island. Through the archaeology, we are primarily looking at the occupation of the property by multiple generations of this family for almost 120 years, specifically the occupation of the property by its first and earliest residence, which was Seneca Boston and Thankful Micah Boston. Thankful Micah was his um, in Wampanoag wife. Seneca Boston first lived in a home with his wife and their six children. Following his purchase of the property in 1774, he actually purchased this property following his manumission from slavery by William Swain, who was one of the original 13 proprietors on the island. However, following Seneca Boston's death in 1809, the property continued to be occupied by his eldest son, Freeborn, and subsequently by Freeborn's wife, Mary, 
and then her husband, her second husband following the death of Freeborn also in 1809, um, Michael Boston Douglas, who was a former mariner from Cape Bird. Mary resided at this property with her three children, Charlotte, Eliza, and William, who continued to hold on to the property roughly until 1910 when it was sold. In 1920, the property was then purchased by Florence Clay Higginbotham, who was a African-American woman who came to the island to work in its burgeoning resort industry. Florence Clay Higginbotham lived at the property until 1972, while also inadvertently uh, contributing and selling her name in the history of the island when she purchased the African Meeting House in 1933, 1933 ultimately conserving it for it, conserving it as a site significant to African American history. So altogether, 200 years of African American history on the island of Nantucket, both spanning both the rise and fall of the whaling industry the rise and um, rise of the New Guinea community and as well as African Americans later transition to and participation in the resort economy. So excavations at this site have been geared towards documenting African American life over that 200 year period. However, in line with the programming held, the educational program uh, programming of the Museum of African American History at the African Meeting House, much of our investigations and interpretations have been geared towards understanding Black life during the 19th century. In particular, the excavations have been from 2008 and 2014 have been extremely productive for examining that period. Excavations uncovered more than 50,000 artifacts, and in particular, two features or two privies, which are just toilets or outhouses, that are dating to the occupation of the Boston Higginbotham House, specifically when the Boston family resided there. The first privy dates to approximately 1802, um, and we've done these dates by looking at um, the average date of the largest number of ceramics found in these units, um, but it dates to roughly 1802. And then the second one dates to roughly 1820, um, specifically when Mary Boston Douglas was residing at the home with Michael Douglas and her three children. These dates also coincide with Nantucket's with the height of the island um, as, it, as its rise at the, of the global whaling industry and also New Guinea. So here, this are, these are pictures of the Privy One dating to Seneca, Boston and Thankful Micah. Um, you're actually seeing to the left, um, if you can see my cursor, this is actually the Privy. And then as you're looking to the right where my cursor is, this is just looking more at what we call the stratigraphy. You can see artifacts that are still actually embedded in the wall. And this was following its, the excavation of it. Most of the artifacts that we recovered out of the privy were related to the basic sort of like activities related to subsistence. Um, so lots of ceramics pointing to food preparation, food storage, food dining. These right here are two ink wells, two ink bottles. Um, interestingly, we also have various fragments of ceramics that were likely produced um, by local Native American tribes. This is actually quite unusual because most of the time when we are actually finding um, ceramics on sites that are dating to the um, early 19th century, we really don't find many ceramics that are pointing to Native American manufacture. The next picture is actually pointing to this, um, pointing to the privy, the second privy that was on the property that was dating to Mary Boston Douglas's occupation of the site. Here too, it was found in the first privy, lots of domestic items. Um, as you can look closely, right here where my cursor is, this is a, a, a nipple shield for nursing. This is also fragments of more ceramics. And right here are just pieces of a necklace. 
Now, as it relates to the central question, however, of trying to better understand Black women's lives during this time period, we have actually found we're primarily focusing on the ceramics to do this. A total of, and I'm actually gonna skip ahead for a slide. I'm sorry about this. So a total of 270 ceramic vessels were identified out of these two features. Most of those 270 ceramics, as I noted earlier, are related to food preparation, food service, and consumption. And the majority of them actually came out of the privy that was linked to Seneca, uh, Seneca Boston and Thankful Michael's occupation of the property. However, as you can see, a closer look at the types of vessel forms of these ceramics actually yield that we see bowls and plates are the most common um, ceramic form found, as well as teacups and saucers, so primarily tablewares and teawares. Um, one of the things that we've actually found when we take a look back at the quantity of ceramics recovered at this site is that here we can see based on this number or at least from the number of ceramics found in Thankful and Seneca Boston's house, um, the privy associated with their household, is that we have concluded that they were largely hosting large meals for their family and guests, and that food storage was integral to the household economy because there was no modern refrigeration. Now you're probably looking at this slide, many of the ceramics, you're not seeing some of the large ceramics that would point to the sort of crocks, jars, and jugs that would have been, that would have held items for food storage. You're mostly seeing some of the fragments of the plates, of the bowls, of the saucers that would have been used in dining. But it's important to ultimately point out that much of what we are actually pointing out about the household is that these large meals would have largely been for their family members and guests, but they would have also taken place during a time when the New Guinea community was still very much still in early formation. So African American men are still going out to well, but they're also, as they are gaining their freedom, buying land, um, investing in um, businesses as they're coming back using with that whaling money, that in some ways that there is a demonstration of their socioeconomic mobility, both through their dining, both through their hosting. Um, we can sort of further speak to this because we know that there were 17 platters, one pitcher, one punch bowl in this assemblage. All of these are items that speak to the hosting of large gatherings, the sort of having and feeding of large numbers of people. Um, and although this is not a good slide showing this, but if you can kind of look a little bit closely, still very in small, small sort of like uh, fragments here, is that some of these ceramics were also quite colorful and quite yeah, qu colorful in their sort of style. In contrast, the ceramic assemblage that's actually linked to Mary Boston Douglas does show some similarities to Thankful and Seneca. So this is still showing the continuity of their dining practices. However, we do start to see fewer number of platters, and we also begin to see a smaller number of utilitarian vessels. For example, instead of the large, instead of crocs, jars, and jugs, we see mostly small redware bowls, which were used primarily for preparing items like porridges or something that was largely liquid based. From this shift in, or this diff, these differences in the ceramics found in this privy, we have been interpreting this as this representing a shift in the domestic labor and subsistence strategies of women in the Boston household. And much of this shift is due to, as the progression of the whaling industry during the 19th century took place, that we're seeing increased urbanization on the island, which means that there's increased reliance on a local food market, but also that women are beginning to work more and more outside of the home as men are 
going away on voyages for a longer period of time. It is important to note that this labor would have been absolutely, or working outside of the home, would have been absolutely integral, especially if a uh, voyage was unsuccessful and a person uh, died at sea, or if a voyage um, if, a, if a mariner did not provide for, pro make provisions before they left for their family um, to ultimately survive off of some of their payments from their legs. The census record shows that Mary Boston Douglas was a domestic, so she worked outside the home, so she likely had a limited amount of time for chores like food preservation. But it also shows that she, in addition to working as a domestic, was largely taking it was taking in borders to also supplement her income. So when we actually go back and we look at the number, of tablewares and teawares that are in this household, we still can interpret this number as evidence of not of, of the continuing of debt of dinners in large dinners for guests, but in particular for the boarders that would have been living in this household. So one of the things that I'd like to point out about using the ceramics to talk about labor and Black women's labor inside of their homes is that much of this labor has actually remained elusive in the archival record. And oftentimes, at first glance at the archaeological record, this labor is elusive. So to begin with the archival record. So the census data, census records do not record occupations for women until 1860. And one of the things that is interesting is that it is oftentimes informally referred to or colloquially referred to as Nantucket being a matriarchy, largely referring to the very active role that women often played, not just economically, but also in terms of the island community, um, stepping into places, into positions oftentimes that would have been traditionally deemed for men in terms of caring for their families. The 1860 census, however, gives you a rundown of the occupations that were listed in the 1860 census for women. And this is an interesting census. Um, we're going to have to project backwards a little bit because we know that by 1860 that there is a decline in the uh, population of Black Islanders and other people of color following the um, 1846 fire. However, it is often, oft, also gives us one of the most tangible looks at what women were doing to earn money. And so as we see, when we look at the 1860, at this list of occupations taken from the 1860 census, there were a total of 448 women who were enumerated as working outside of their homes. This is actually 14% of the island's female population. And that population was actually 3,302 women that were formally counted in the census. And of that, there were 73 Black and women of color. So as you can see from looking at this list, that Nantucket women were represented in a range of both skilled and what would have been viewed as unskilled occupations. Um, most of these occupations, however, were filled by white women on the island. When you look at the column for Black and other women of color, Black women are disproportionately represented as domestics. Now, with only 13, excuse me, with only 11 listed as domestics, even though at the time, and as I said, there are 448 women who are enumerated as occupations, and that 73 Black and other women of color were actually formally listed in the census. This is an undercount of, or perhaps an underrepresentation of the span or of the diversity um, of the type of. We know that borders are listed off and living in people's houses, but the actual title of boarding house 
we only see, we see no black women actually formally listed as holding borders. Yet when we look at the volume of the ceramics, the frequency of the ceramics that are found on the site at the Boston Higginbotham House, we can look at that as evidence of the ways in which work that took place in the home we have oftentimes been unrecognized um, as a form of legitimate wage labor by census keepers, but would have still had a very important impact in helping women on the island, in particular Black women on the island, uh, take care of their families, take care of their communities. So why does this ultimately matter? Why is this significant? So one of the important things that this research is actually speaking to is it's highlighting the ways in which in the ways in which the intersection of race, class, and gender oppression made the experiences of Black and other women different from both white women and Black men on the island. Much of our scholarship or much of our historical writings on uh, New Guinea focuses on um, the experiences and contributions of Black men, and oftentimes well-known Black men such as Absalom Boston. Essex Boston. However, we know that, or we, it's, it's safe to assume that Black women would have also been stepping in and making equally as important contributions into them. And so acknowledging the ways in which the intersection of race, class, and gender would have contributed to this, or to at least both their invisibility, is one way to make them more visible. The other thing too is looking at the ceramics or looking at the archaeology specifically as a way to address that gap in those documents. So the study, the archaeology is ultimately pointing to the different types of labor beyond just caring for one's family that would have been engaged in both to earn money, but also to potentially expand familial and social networks. This is important because Mary Douglas's daughter, both Eliza and Charlotte, end up marrying two men um, who come to the island, both uh, Wesley and Isaac Berry, who come to the island to work in the whaling industry. Um, both of those men were very involved in the abolitionist movement. Those men were also involved in various local um, other sort of uh, local community activism, but we know that Eliza and Charlotte could potentially have been contributing to the activism that their spouses would have engaged in. And we can look at the ceramics that was found at the site as thinking about and imagining the ways in which their labor would have taken on more nuanced meaning and perhaps more uh, political meaning um, in terms of supporting their community. We also know that this work would have increased women's domestic activities. And so while also trying to make room for thinking about the labor that women are doing, um, not just to earn money, but also in support of their communities, but also thinking about the way in which women's work um, continues to, um, like the ways in which it would have been not just would have been undervalued. Women would have been cooking not just for borders, but also thinking about the way in which Mary would have been having to leave her home to also work the job that she would have been earning wages for. So I'm going to conclude, and I'm going to conclude by ultimately making a case for increased archaeology. Um, much of our understanding of 19th century life on the island continues to be shaped by our understanding largely through the archaeology done at the Boston Higginbotham House. However, the archaeology on the island has the potential, more archaeology can expand our current knowledge of African American life. It can both complicate our existing historical narratives while also illuminating new historical um, understandings about African American life and cultural practices. But most importantly, more archaeology will allow for us to identify more sites that speak to the dynamism of the African American community. And I will conclude there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I, I just, I really learned a lot. Um, about about the history of the site. I mean, I feel like, you know, uh, as someone who works at a historical association, I guess sometimes I come in feeling like I, I am familiar with history and I know I know what's up, you know, but there's just always so much more to learn. And I, I just 
wanted to open it up for questions and we have um, you know several archaeologists in the audience I see tonight as well as several people who are connected to the African Meeting House in different ways and the Boston Higginbotham House so I'm curious what questions they have but I'd like to start off with you know you said increased archaeology and I'm just curious could you talk a little bit about uh, for the lay people here what does increased archaeology mean like what could that look like so right now, increased archaeology is just the need to do more excavations. Um, right now, I mean, archaeology, as I, as I mentioned, has been a really important resource for documenting, um, or at least for identifying historic sites related to the history of Black people on the island. So when we look at the museum, of, um, excuse me, the properties owned by the Museum of African American History, two of our most tangible and visible representations of the New Guinea community are um, the Meeting House and the Boston Higginbotham House. And much of what we know about not just the sort of activities that took place at that property, but the way in which life changed over time for the occupants that would have been there have been because of archaeology. However, when we think about the key sources on Black history on the island. These are sources that have been written by scholars such as Frances Cartoon and the, the, her book, The Other Islanders, remains the definitive source on Black history on the island. And then when we couple that with the work by um, Isabel kaudenbach Cod Mayer and then the edited volume um, on Black Nantucket history by Robert Johnson, um, we actually know that there are many more individuals and families um, who made up and contributed to the history of the island, but in terms of where they were both physically and also thinking about how their lives may have actually been um, maybe different from the Boston families or how they may have actually um, ultimately been impacted by changes in the whaling industry. We know very little about that. And so in some ways, we need to uh, increased archaeology would allow for us to actually build a larger set sample set that would give us a better indication um, of both not just um, um, black life on the island but the ways in which there would have been differences within um, these people's lives. Um, this is really important because as I'm talking about uh, Black life, we know that New Guinea was also a multiracial and multi-ethnic community. And so this means that increased archaeology also gives us a, an opportunity to think about and to bring in other individuals, such as the Wampanoag community, thinking more about the relationships as people were increasingly racialized as Black, but who may have been from other parts of the African diaspora um, in terms of understanding how they may have actually lived too. Oh, I love this. Yeah, there's there's so much there. I mean, I think one, um, just this idea that there are so many more people that make up the history of Nantucket than the, the kind of well-trod stories, right? And that even if we can't know the fullness of their lives, right? Like we can't know so much about them, we can still get glimpses of their lives from different ways. I mean, even here at the research library, I think about the photographs we have of people and, and can we just even find a little bit more about them if we have like their name or we know vaguely when this picture was taken, like what can we learn about them and, and how can that relate to our lives here today? And I, I think I think that's this is just a really interesting other way to look at that through archaeology and, and I think that's also nice just because what you were saying where there just really isn't the same kind of documentary record for a lot of the community of color on the island that there is for for the white community and so this to me is, is really fascinating is just another way to try to like fill that record in and to to kind of expand what we know um, so this may be a bit of a novice question but I'm just wondering are there any plans to do additional archaeological digs at the Boston Higginbotham house or would, would we say that that's, you know, we've kind of done that, that that's, we're all set? Currently, there are, no, there are no additional plans to do additional excavations at um, the Boston Higginbotham House. However, the artifacts, artifacts that were excavated from both um, the African Meeting House in 1993 and 1996, and the artifacts from 2008 and 2014 continue to be housed and studied by archaeologists um, at UMass Boston. Um, and this research is actually in conjunction with the Museum of African American History in terms of their interest on having a lot of 
African-American community life. Um, right now, we have, I have six grad students who are actually conducting research on the um, artifacts that have come out of both of those sites. But I also have one student who is currently doing a project where he has used the deed records um, and the census records from 1790 to 1860 to actually reconstruct both the population of New Guinea, so both this sort of demographic, um, to do a demographic profile, but to also begin to try to physically map the New Guinea community beyond those two properties and just our understandings of the sort of five corners, like the streets marked by the five corners area. Um, and so one of our hopes is to actually use that information to potentially see if there are any other sites that could potentially be excavated to help us broaden our current sort of like sample to ask more questions about labor or even specifically women's work in the community. And this is with only a small portion of your attention on New England. <laughs> I can't wait to see how things develop when you kind of turn turn more fully from Texas to, to New England. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in. I'm just wondering, what was the most surprising find? Oh, that's a good question. So, you know, this is that's a that's a very that's a very difficult question. <laughs> And I'm going to answer it in two ways. So I think one of the most surprising finds continues to be the ceramics that we believe were actually made uh, by uh, Native Americans. Um, and that's just really, so this is a surprising find for a myriad of reasons. Um, the first thing is, is that when we begin to look at 19th century households were actually, of course, looking at a time where just the manufacturing of just goods, I mean, they're mass manufactured, they're being spread throughout. And so, and, and, and in some ways, when we think about ceramics, we typically are expecting to find or mostly find um, American or British made ceramics. Now, this has implications for when we think about Black and Indigenous people in their presence, um, in the sense that oftentimes during this time period, there's the assumption, and there was even the incorrect sort of stereotype being promoted that Native peoples were disappearing, and that as they were disappearing because their populations were declining, that intermingling with other groups, in particular um, intermingling with people of African descent was also leading to a disappearance in their cultural activities. And so when we think about the discovery of those ceramics and specifically the discovery of those um, Native Amer possibly Native American made ceramics in a context and belonging to a household that was with a African American man, an indigenous wife and their black and native children we're possibly looking at the ways in which these households would have still been trying to retain and hold on to their heritage and what would have been actually a quite diverse heritage. So I think that that's probably one of the most surprising and also really exciting um, things about the archaeology, but also in terms of exciting in terms of its potential that it leads to also complicate how we understand race. Oftentimes race is a very homogenizing category. And so we literally think about literally as New Guinea becomes even more diverse of people, literally this them simply being labeled as black or mulatto. And so I think that those discoveries really trouble, those sort of trouble the way that such simplistic categorizations have been applied to how we think about individuals in this community. Um, I think the other sort of surprise for me was just the sheer volume of the ceramics that were being found um, and also being able to use the ceramics to look at differences in what women were doing. Um, I wasn't expecting to see such a underrepresentation of black women and, and, and other women of color in the census record. And so this was really, you, being able to use the ceramics was really one of the more concrete evidence to actually begin to give them um, to fill out what they were doing and to also give it meaning beyond just, oh, this is one more 
thing that people, women would have been doing in their homes that would have been either viewed as unskilled or maybe sort of low waged to try to just breathe more life into it. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come in uh, related to the privies. So I'm going to ask them. Um, what are, why are there so many different types of items found in the privy? Did people use that as a garbage pit? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, simple and answer. Yeah. <laughs> they did. <laughs> Privies um, are moved and they throw garbage in them when they move. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and so this, I feel like the second question is kind of asking the same thing. They say, how is it that the archaeological finds were in the two privies? And I guess the answer to that would be they were using it for trash. So yes. um, pretty straightforward. So were there, so this is coming from a, a, another archaeologist, were there any items in the assemblage that reflect the household members' spirituality or their overall religious beliefs? Good question. So yes. Yes. So this is a rather complicated answer. Um, so in the theses that have actually been produced by students, so in particular, there's been a dissertation that has been written on the 2008 excavations of the site by an archeologist named Teresa Bulger. Um, there's also been um, a thesis written by former UMass Boston students um, Michael Way and Carolyn Horlicker um, that have actually been looking at not just at um, the lives of the Boston family members, but in particular, looking at their lives in conversation with the dominant discourse surrounding racial uplift that took place at that time. And one of the things that their research has found is that the African Meeting House, which was also a church and school, but would have really been almost the central social institution for not just in terms of how community members would have gathered or mobilized politically, but also in terms of shaping how people thought about themselves as a community. And so the African Meeting House was really a central place in which people came together around sort of this desire not only to be free, but also to think about the ways in which they would shape their identities around that. And so through the church, this sort of notion of being um, pious, of being submissive, of being, um, there were very specific gender roles for men and women through this. And many of those gender roles are, were shaped largely through a Judeo-Christian um, religious sort of like, pretty much like, I would say discourse. And so when we actually think about materials. So when we, I point it to the necklace or when I begin to point to or talk about, oh, we have all of these ceramics and some of them are actually have various kind of patterns on them. So there may be a mother bird pattern or a floral pattern. Many of those patterns are also in conversation with notions that are gendered and how people would ultimately have performed those gender ideals. So it's both in line with not just religion, but also very much has a political significance to it for a free Black community during that time. Amazing. Um, so I guess the answer is uh, yes, there were items. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's thank you. And um, we have time for a few more questions. Um, I have one more that's come in. And so if anyone has any additional questions they'd like to ask, now is the time. But one question that's come in is, did you, were there any items or in, like any kind of information that you were expecting to find, but you, but wasn't there? Was there any surprise in that regard of what wasn't there? Good question, what's not there? So one of the things that we, that what was not there, um, we know from our from our study of the historical records that Seneca Boston was a weaver and that there was a shop on that property. Interestingly, we don't we were unable to find evidence that specifically pointed to weaving in a shop. Um, so we didn't find any weaving evidence and we didn't find a shop. 
We did, however, and this is actually through continued study of looking at the deed records from properties in New England, see shop represented several times in those records. So beginning to think of types of businesses that would have been also in New Guinea, but again, thinking about how they may not leave a material signature, but they are still sort of elusively referenced in the archival record was pretty much an idea of thinking about what was absent, but also present. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I feel like I ask these questions not knowing what's going to come out of them. And it's just, uh, there's, you just have so much, <laughs> so much you're sharing with us tonight. This is amazing. Thank you. Um, another question's come in. Have you found any objects that speak to Africa? <sighs> that's a, that's a complicated question. I would say not in the sense of being able to think about to in terms of linking artifacts to particular ethnic groups in Africa. Um, much of when we think about the way in which the artifacts at this site would have been pointing to Africa, it is thinking about Africa more symbolically and politically. So with the labeling of the African meeting house and sort of the way in which the community members of New Guinea would have been organizing around Africa as a place in which both people of African descent in that community trying to, uh, who have had, um, were facing racism, but also attempting to still fight and sort of stand up for the experiences of individuals who would have been enslaved in the South. It was sort of thinking about Africa broadly as a, a unifying term of people who would have shared a history of oppression because of their connection ancestrally to that place, but not in terms of being able to link specific objects to ethnic groups or particular types of cultural practices done by those particular ethnic groups. And a lot of that also just ha we can probably attribute some of this to the transatlantic slave trade um, really complicating that. Great, thank you. Um, that was our last question that has come in this evening, Nitra. Um, and you've done an incredible job answering all of these questions on the fly. I, I really appreciated your time tonight and, and all that you've shared with us this evening. Um, and we look forward to continuing this relationship and seeing what we can, you know, how we can partner together in the future. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and I just want to thank everybody else who who's uh, spent part of their evening with us tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. This is the last lecture in our NHA University series focused on archaeology. Media sponsorship for this evening's program is generously provided by Novation Media. Please join us on February 25th, so that's next Thursday, for a workshop on genealogical research with Charmaine Bonner and Jessica Sadlow. NHA University will start back up in March with a focus on Nantucket's geographic connections. Programs such as this one are made possible thanks to the support of our members. So if you are not a member, please do consider joining by heading to nha.org slash membership. Um, thank you so much and have a great night. Thank you.